The approval rating is fairly high. Uh, I looked at the approval ratings for the last six elected presidents, that is not Gerald Ford, um, but the elected presidents, starting with Richard Nixon. And after 100 days in office, after they took office, they were generally in the same range, uh, mostly from the high 50s to the high 60s. Uh, the only one who's been a little bit higher than Barack Obama is Ronald Reagan. But then I noticed something. If you go back to John Kennedy, after his 100 days, he was at 83. And Dwight Eisenhower was at 74. They were higher, which says something important about what's happened in American politics. We are in an era, we have been for 40 years now, since the late 1960s, the Great Red-Blue Divide, uh, the great cultural civil war that started in the 1960s. We've never gotten over it. It's divided the country more and more. The Red-Blue Divide is still there. And that means that when a new president enters office, uh, he, and so far they have been all these, uh, he doesn't have the reserve of goodwill from the country that Eisenhower or Kennedy or previous presidents have had. Uh, even Frank, certainly Franklin Roosevelt had when he was first elected. There was a sense that even members of the opposition party would give the new president some time. Instead, since the late 1960s and the beginning of this big divide, every president enters office with a hard core of supporters and a hard core of opponents. And we're certainly seeing that now. President Obama. And I understand that, Frank. I think that the fact that you see increases in, <laughs> in, uh, in both uh, the approval and the disapproval uh, suggests that uh, it is a very activist administration. They've tackled a lot of issues, and people are choosing up sides. Uh, and I think it's, it's natural that you would see the disapproval increase even at the same time that the approval increase. Uh -huh. So this, you want to sure me? <clears throat> this begs the question of the honeymoon period. Uh, if the approval ratings are relatively high for the modern period, um, when does the rubber meet the road? Uh, when should we expect um, uh, the honeymoon period to end? And uh, conversely, what will he have to do to prolong it? Or what will have to happen for it to be prolonged? Jim, you want to? Well, I mean, he all, I mean starting with his uh, first budget, though, he saw very little Republican support, uh, virtually no Republican support on the stimulus package. Uh, I mean, I don't think he got the kind of bipartisan support that an Eisenhower or Kennedy would have gotten in their day for his early initiatives. Uh, so in that sense, it almost ended before it began. Um, you know, that said, uh, I mean, I think that he continues to track very well. He continues to be very persuasive to the American people and abroad. Uh, so I think he's got a huge amount of mileage left I mean, you know, there, there's always going to be uh, test cases, I suppose, uh, the, the debate over the Supreme Court nomination uh, will be one early uh, opportunity to see what kind, of, uh, what kind of honeymoon or throwaway he has with the Congress. But what about this idea that um, people are distinguishing between their approval of Obama as a person and their actual, actually quite the disapproval in many cases of his politics, that is, what he's in fact, of his policy, yeah. what, is he, what is he in fact doing? Is that a fair distinction to make between sort of the personality and the policies? Yes. The president is more popular than his policies. And that's generally true? Of all presidents, you mean? No. no. <laughs> this president is more popular than his policies. His policies aren't really unpopular but they are the subject of a good deal more dissent and, and controversy than the president himself. He has a pretty good reserve of goodwill. Uh, they're doing, which, of course, very strong support from his own party and from independents. Uh, and even some Republicans continue to like him as an individual. He himself he is very popular. Uh, and that really helps his policies because, uh, you know, I always a report that the president's job approval rating is the Dow Jones Industrial Index of Washington. Uh, if you want to know what, how, what mood is in New York, look at the Dow. If you want to know what the mood is in Washington, look at the approval rating. When the president's approval rating is high, as Barack Obama's is right now, and it seems likely to say that way, he's like, he has real power, not just popularity, but real power. Even uh, some, it, uh, well, I won't say the opposition party, but the, the opposition party is at least friendly to him. He can get things done. If a president's approval rating drops, and George Bush in his second term had the longest string on record of a president without majority approval from the American public, it's kind of tough for him to get what he wants, because even his own party will run away from it, which is what happened to President Bush. 
And I think you see uh, already the party, remember the Congress, the Congress trying to run against, trying to separate him from his policies and run against it as a, as a policy policy or as a, you know, trying to find some way to wrap, it, uh, wrap the policies around another individual who's easier to fight with, with limited success. So there's been a lot of discussion of um, the Democrats in Congress and that Obama's greatest challenge may not be either the general public or the Republican Party, but his own party in Congress. <laughs> Some people would say, well, that's a good oxymoron. Wouldn't they, in fact, want to support his agenda? And given that they have not been particularly cooperative, I mean, they voted on the stimulus package, but there's been a lot of sort of back and forth between the White House and, and, and congressional leadership. Is this normal? Uh, particularly when you're controlling uh, the legislature and the White House at the same time, what, what, how, do you, how do you understand this dynamic? Well, I guess, uh, go ahead, yeah, I guess I would just say uh, preliminarily the uh, in the stimulus debate, for instance, I think what you saw is the fact that you have many Democratic agendas, not a single Obama Democratic agenda. There's a lot of pent up uh, desire uh, in members of Congress for spending on certain projects that they want. Um, some uh, well-intentioned, some uh, greedier, uh, and they're not going to—they're not going to accept merely because they have a popular chief executive that they should lay off a project they've been trying to get done for eight years with no success. This is an opportunity, and I think to some degree he's got to fight that back. And I think that's where there is stress between uh, Obama and leaders of the of the party. Do you think I'm overstating the the? Um, um, any perceived tension between the Democrats in Congress and the President or the White House? A little. I think the Democrats in Congress are very respectful and admiring of Barack Obama. They've been supportive of his agenda. If they are frustrated, as any some of them are, it is for this reason. I've heard more than a few Democrats in Congress say this. We won a remarkable victory in 2006. Before Barack Obama, before Barack Obama, we seized control of Congress and reversed the revolution of 1994, when the Republicans gained control. We did that. And then two years later, what happened? We won the White House and expanded our majorities in Congress. And then they say, if that's not a mandate, what is? It's a mandate for the Democrats to govern. Why, they ask me and people like us, why does Obama have this fetish for bipartisanship? <laughs> why don't we just govern? We're better at it. We control it. We want a mandate. Hello. So, uh, <laughs> I didn't know we were quite going there, Bill. But, uh, <laughs> but since you've raised Piccadillo's, um, what might count for it? Why isn't he just, why isn't he stepping up, as uh, much as Bush did early on, and said, I have a mandate, he hurt someone, yeah. and said, this is what we're going to do. He has a very light agenda, and this is where we're headed. How come the president doesn't just do that? because he has a mandate of his own, which is different. His mandate, I believe, was, like any new president, to deliver something that the voters wanted that they weren't getting from the incumbent. Um, I, you know, I have a whole lecture on this, which I will not do. But uh, <laughs> I think, you know, uh, Jimmy Carter was elected to bring morality to the government after Watergate. Ronald Reagan was elected to bring strong and decisive leadership after Carter was criticized as wishy-washy and ineffectual. Bill Clinton brought empathy because the first George Bush was out of touch with the American people when he looked at his watch. He seemed unfamiliar with the supermarket scanner. Um, I think that Barack Obama was elected to deliver something that George W. Bush promised. Promised. I was there when he said in November 1999, and he never delivered. He said, I'm going to be a uniter, not a divider. <laughs> what Bush did was take a country that was pretty badly divided under Bill Clinton and divided even more, mostly because of the Iraq War, plus social issues. Barack Obama knows that's what got him elected. He was elected to bring the country together. He is biracial. He can speak a language of faith. He appealed to independents as well as some Republicans, uh, a lot of states. Indiana, North Carolina, Virginia, a lot of whites are in the uh, as well as African Americans. He knows that his mandate was bipartisanship, and that's why he will say back to the Democrats in Congress, that's not why I was elected. I was elected to bring the country together. And to his credit, even though he hasn't succeeded a great deal, uh, the Republicans are, have not been willing to stand up to support him. Uh, nevertheless, he's continuing to reach out to them because he knows that was his mandate.
I also, it's always risky to uh, examine these figures uh, psychologically, I think, but I think he actually wants to be a part of bipartisan figure. He wants to be a divided figure. And I, uh, I don't know whether it's possible, and especially in you know, the divide that Bill just described, uh, but I, I think that given his druthers, he would govern in a bipartisan way. On the other hand, you know, elections matter, and, uh, and winning is winning, and they won, and I suspect that they will not let uh, you know, a, a fascination of bipartisanship slow it down. Bill, you brought up uh, the 2006 elections. Some people will argue that the 2010 midterms will be the real test. So the history of American midterm elections is that the party of the president typically loses seats uh, in the midterm election. Um, so the question is, will Obama, will the Democrats lose seats in the midterm? Is it a will it be a referendum on uh, Obama? And I guess the, the other shoe of this is, can Obama turn this sort of new electoral force that he unleashed during the election, new voters, first time voters, younger voters, voters captured via all kinds of information technologies, can all that get translated into midterm electoral force enough to stave off a midterm loss to the Democrats? There is, of course, a thousand variables uh, involved in the midterm like the state of the economy. Generally, you, you're a political scientist, I'm a political scientist, there are many distinguished political scientists here at UCLA. One of the things we know, and we try to explain to people, is that if you want a clue as to what's going to happen, even in the midterm, when the president's not on the, not on the ballot, just check out the president's job approval rating. If his job approval rating is high, his party will usually do well. If it's low, his party usually suffers as Bush has suffered in 2006 uh, because his job approval rating was so low. Uh, the president's party doesn't always lose seats in midterm. When Bill Clinton faced impeachment in 1998, the Democrats defied expectations in game seats because the president was still very, very popular. So 2010, the Democrats, the odds are, simply if you look at the seats that are up, the Democrats are likely to lose some seats in the House. And that's simply because they picked up a lot of seats in 2006 and 2008 in normally Republican districts, where the voters were angry. In 2006, it was Iraq. In 2008, it was the economy. But they were angry. And if they're not still angry at the Republicans and President Bush, because he's no longer there, uh, then, then the Democrats may not have that advantage. And some of those vulnerable seats in the House, in the House, are likely to be lost. Uh, the Senate has a different mix. The Senate seats that are up in 2010 were the Senate seats that were up in 2004, six years ago. That was a good Republican year. And that's a year when Republicans are defending, I don't have a list in front of me, but they're defending a lot of vulnerable seats. So my guess, without you know, a year and a half in advance of this thing is, you know, other things being equal, which they never are, other things being equal, the Democrats are likely to lose seats in the House and gain seats in the Senate, putting them probably um, over 60. And if that's the case, that law for the loss of a few House seats is really irrelevant in the yeah. population. If they pick up a seat in the Senate or hold even, uh, that that's the fundamental piece of politics in the election. Well, listen, uh, I'm an opinion editor, so here's an opinion. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think the Republican Party is lost. Uh, they are. Uh, unclear about what unites them as a party, clearly divided between a cultural wing and an economic wing. Uh, they have a, a, the idea of a sort of laissez-faire government that doesn't intrude on the lives of people that cuts up against their views on abortion and other social issues. Uh, I think the Republican Party today only exists to say no to Obama. And until it figures out what it is going forward, uh, I think they will be a minority party, uh, and potentially for a very long time. I mean, I think uh, we watched the Republican Party uh, take a walk in 1933, and it took until 1952, with Eisenhower's election, to get back uh, with the Congress uh, and the presidency. I think they are, unless they figure this out quickly, the longer they argue about whether Mike Steele or Rush Limbaugh is the rightful head of the party, the longer they stay in the wilderness. Uh, and so I think one of the things Obama has most going for him right now that he has effectively no coherent opposition. Now, that's true. Uh, the Democrats have a very big advantage, and Frank, you alluded to this when you talked about the kind of majority that Obama builds. Something else political scientists know is that when you want to build a majority, you have to find available groups that are 
generally weak on partisanship or new to the electorate, <coughs> convert them to your party ideas, and then they will stay there for a long time. Uh, Franklin Roosevelt did that with immigrant groups, Catholic, urban Catholic groups, uh, and African Americans, who had been Republicans, in the 1930s. He, he brought them into the Democratic Party, and they, they became the foundation of the New Deal Democrats. Uh, the Republicans built their uh, somewhat smaller majority in the 60s and 70s, first with Nixon's Southern strategy of reaching out to Southern whites, uh, mostly over the racial backlash and law and order issues, and then Ronald Reagan added to that by reaching out to religious conservatives. He added to the racial, the Southern strategy, the religious strategy, which brought a lot of religious voters into the Republican Party. Well, Obama has found new sources of votes from, for Democrats. Young voters who have, were strong supporters of the Democratic Party and are likely to remain there for a long time. New minorities who have not been terribly partisan in recent years. Uh, but uh, voted very strongly Democrat, uh, Democratic last time. There was a lot of discussion about whether Latino voters would vote for an African American. It was no problem. They voted overwhelmingly for Barack Obama. I mean, I, I heard lots of silly talk about this issue. It just didn't happen. So Obama is building the base. The Republican support is getting very perilous. A friend of mine, I won't name him, he said that the Republican Party is no longer a party. It's a cult. But you know, we call it the cult of Ronald Reagan. Uh, certainly, they certainly know what they believe. They believe in conservative ideology that holds them together. They're at war with themselves right now over whether this new effort to find new ideas for the party is somehow rejecting Reaganism and rejecting conservatism. Conservatives won control of the Republican Party with Ronald Reagan after decades of fighting and bleeding and sacrificing and struggling, and they ain't going to give it up. When John McCain ran against conservatives in 2000, they said, to hell with you. And they rejected him and nominated Bush. And when McCain was nominated, he had to essentially run as a conservative. He didn't change the face of the image of the party. Well, what Republicans need more than anything else is a popular, charismatic leader. I don't think that's Sarah Palin. <laughs> but give her a chance. Give her a chance. Uh, they need someone. And who is it? Eric Cantor? Uh, I mean, he's uh, up and coming. Bobby Jindal had a, a moment on the stage. Uh, didn't work that well. <laughs> John McCain. He could have done it, but he chose instead to run as a down line conservative. Uh, there you know, are just not a lot of new faces. John Boehner. Uh, Mitch McConnell. I mean, these are not people that Republicans are eager to rally around. I think they got their ideas. Their ideas have been there for decades. What they need is a new face. A new what about leader. General Petraeus? There's been a lot of talk about him. And what, so what's the inside the Beltway scoop on that? That he's given no indication at this point that he's eager to get involved in politics. But there are an awful lot of Republicans who look at him as their next Eisenhower. <laughs> And there are a lot of conservatives who say, Eisenhower betrayed us. He wasn't a real conservative. Do we want to take another chance? Sure. Yeah, they were still sticking over Eisenhower, so long. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> they are. Just kind of like what Kim already said, which is that the effect of Latinos and all of us, particularly our consequence here in California, there was a moment where it seemed like Republicans could make real inroads among Latino voters, where there is some. Uh, uh, overlap uh, in social agendas with a uh, Catholic constituency. Um, you know, and then I think when in the primaries when Obama ran against Clinton, a lot of Latino support for Clinton, and people wondered whether that would cost him in the general. Uh, Bill said that just simply did not pan out. Uh, and I think the Republican Party uh, has hurt itself in a number of ways, particularly here in California, with respect to its outreach to Latinos. But at this point, they feel quite solidly democratic, which is something that one might not have anticipated five or ten years ago. I, th I think that's dead right, I and mean, you could make an even stronger argument that <laughs> where they sort of roll the dice is with a population that's getting <coughs> older, smaller, and more regionally located. And so the question is, where do they go? And, and are in danger of losing moderates. I mean, the moderates in the party are sort of stuck. They don't, when you talk to moderate Republicans, they say, I don't know where to go. Uh, they feel the party's being held captive by the right wing. Uh, 
that are not quite ready to jump on the Obama bandwagon. But, but I mean, part of the reality of Specter switching parties was that there was no place for him in the Republican Party. I mean, I think in Specter's case, that's where the largest of Pennsylvania politics and his own fortunes. But I think that's true. I mean, there was once a very uh, robust piece of the Republican Party, that Wall Street conservative, right. with no great uh, investment in the Republican Party's uh, social agenda, is now without a home. There was a, I thought, quite perceptive uh, New York Times op-ed that ran after the G20 summit, in which the author noted that, that Barack Obama is the only member of the G20 that could win office in any member of the G20. <laughs> 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 and that, you know, that isn't everything, but that is something. Uh, I think that that is a foundation uh, for a new relationship, in that case, with the major uh, industrial countries. Uh, but, you know, I actually happened to be in, uh, in Kansas City this past week reading some foreign journalists who were visiting the United States for several months. They were from uh, Uganda and South Korea, and Vietnam, and Egypt, and Pakistan, Malaysia, uh, India, and to a person, they described the the ebullience uh, in their countries uh, at the uh, at the Obama election. And again, uh, friendliness and a warm reception on everything. But I do think, uh, especially at a time when we are trying to conceive of an economic recovery that is international and requires a high degree of cooperation that uh, not being George Bush means a lot, uh, and, and being Barack Obama means a lot. So I do think that there is a clearly a stylistic shift. I mean, even small gestures, but I think that matter, uh, giving his first television interview uh, to an Arab uh, TV station. But not Al Jazeera. Right. <laughs> well, they're not stupid. <laughs> so I think that there's a lot of that kind of uh, attention to detail at work right now. And it's long term applications, I think, are a little hard to tell at this point. But they've clearly moved off a, a very negative international path. So Jim's certainly suggesting I have to agree with this is hardly debatable, but the tone has changed. Bill, you, one of the things we kept hearing, and, and again it was a quite an international meeting we were at, was there was a deep there were deep seated concerns that while his tone had changed and while that was good, the policies hadn't really changed. They were concerned about troop buildup in Afghanistan. Uh, they were continued to be concerned about uh, uh, the Palestine question in Israel. Do you see policy changing on, on, in the administration different from relative to the Bush administration? Not dramatic, and there are simple reasons for that. The interests of the United States, which are at the core of our foreign policy, our interests haven't really changed. I mean, our interest is to stop Iran from developing a nuclear weapon. Uh, the North Koreans probably already have one, but to try to reverse that as much as we can, to try to do something about uh, Al Qaeda and the Taliban in uh, Pakistan and Afghanistan. Those commitments are just the same. We're trying to do it in a different way. In Pakistan and Afghanistan, uh, just last week, the president tried to make it clear that while we supported those governments, we weren't going to embrace them quite as unconditionally as the Bush administration did, because they have a lot of domestic critics. There are allegations of corruption because the warmer the United States embrace, the more they get in trouble in their own countries. Uh, so we're trying to do it in a little bit of a different way. But our interests are exactly the same. The one question I do hear from many diplomats in Washington, in the diplomatic community, before Obama got elected, and now, it's an interesting question. Diplomats ask one thing. Is he tough? They always knew George Bush was a tough guy. And Lyndon Johnson, people like that were always tough. Nixon was tough. What they're not assured of yet is how tough Obama is. He has, they don't believe he's really been tested. I mean, he did well in the Somali pirates episode, which was risky, and you know, he's, he really, he, he did handle that extremely well. Uh, just met with Captain Phillips. But um, the fact is, the big test hasn't come yet. Every president faces one. And what a lot of foreigners want to know is, how tough will he be in standing up? I mean, Reagan's first test of toughness actually was not in foreign affairs. It was the Pacto strike, when the air traffic controllers went on strike, and he impressed the whole world that given a formidable enemy in this case, it was, it was a union, he stood them down, he fired them, and the system got through it. Uh, they want to see that kind of test for Obama, and they're waiting to see it. So people would say, look, uh, at some level, he stood up to stood up to GM, he hired the CEO. He's taken a fairly hard line. I, I, I was just on a call Friday with a very large 
court producers that they probably got me to speak at this board meeting. I don't know. I, I think they don't know what I'm going to say. And so they, <laughs> on the call was the chairman of this big international company, a Texan. And so we were talking about, like our call, what we were going to talk about. And all they wanted to talk about was how horrible, intrusive, interventionist, rigid, corrosive, destructive, the Obama administration was vis-a-vis the economy. Uh, yeah, they couldn't believe that he would that he would want to regulate boards. They couldn't believe that he would want to regulate executive compensation. In fact, on the phone and said, "My God, what are we going to do?" And I, you know, I just I wanted to say, "Act right." It wouldn't be a problem. <laughs> But this is guy, so he stood up to me so far. He stood up to the automakers, he told Chrysler, I gave you a chance, you know, you've got to go to the bankruptcy court. I mean, so A, doesn't that show toughness? But B, the larger question, you know, does he have a tiger by the tail with the economy? Is this a no win for him? Or that, that is to say what he does might not matter? <coughs> What you, so what, what do you think of this handling of the economy? I certainly don't think it's a no win, only because it was so bad when he took over that it's hard to imagine it getting so much worse that it would take it down. Uh, on the other hand, there's a lot of upside potential. Uh, I think one of the questions is can things begin to recover in time for midterm elections? Um, but uh, there is some reason, I think, for optimism. People, uh, it's only a month or two ago that people were talking about an eight to 10 year recession. Uh, now we're talking about whether the economy might rebound by the end of the year. Now I'm not saying that's all Obama. I think there's a lot of, a lot of stuff here that is beyond his reach. But I think there's clearly the, not only is it a, not a no win, I think there's a potential for a big landscape changing, decisive, historic. So what do you, what do you think here on the economy and the, what the administration has done so far and sort of what the future looks like? Oh, I made a little list while you were talking of the, <laughs> of the agenda items. Look at this agenda. It's an amazing agenda. Any one of these things would be a big agenda. Mortgages. Jobs, the economic stimulus package, $747 billion. Uh, he's about to undertake a new initiative for universal health care. Energy policy. Education. He says he's going to reduce the deficit, cut it in half in 10 years. Uh, tax reform. He's going to deliver tax cuts to the middle class, tax hikes to the wealthy. Um, he's going to bail out the banks. You're not supposed to say bail out. He's going to rescue the banks. <laughs> and he's going to rescue the American automobile industry. And one more thing, he's pursuing a war in Afghanistan. That's 10 things. Any one of them would be a huge agenda. This, this, we're no longer, remember Bill Clinton after 1996 when the Republicans took over Congress? He said, the era of big government is over. And he then started talking about school uniforms and more police on the beat and very small scale initiatives, small core politics, because the Democrats were on the defensive. Being on the defensive with an agenda like this, this is huge. And by the way, he added two more to it. He said, somewhere down the line, but not immediately, we're going to talk about immigration reform and we're going to talk about doing something about climate change. Those are big things. They are enormous. No wonder your friends are a little bit upset. You didn't mean, I was, I'm friends a little strong. <laughs> I am amazed that they didn't use the S word. He's a socialist. Or in, in, in the 30s, they called Roosevelt the Bolshevik. These are huge interventions and a major sea change in American politics. How will Americans judge it? They'll judge it the way they judge it. Does it work? If the economy is better, if the auto industry gets back on its feet, if the credit industry revives, Americans are pragmatists. Pragmatists believe whatever works is right. <laughs> Ideologues believe that if something is wrong, it can't possibly work, even if it does work. <laughs> change in American culture, had we, we were now in a supposed post-racial America. Um, 
Of course, now we're not very much about that. He was pressed recently and kind of slid a little bit with it. So one question is, with this election, has the culture changed in a significant way, particularly vis-a-vis -vis race? Um, two, um, are we in a post-racial uh, America, or is that a misnomer? Well, I hope to I live to see a post-racial America. <laughs> <laughs> no, I do I I would love to be a part of a post-racial America. I don't think we're doing that. You know, I do think that the breadth and depth of his victory, though, is consequential. That he did not just win with with white liberals and blacks. He won majorities of Latinos, of Asians, of young people, of everyone but white men over 65. And, you know, <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a problem to solve itself. <laughs> <laughs> He is not Jesse Jackson. He is not Al, Al Sharpton. He did not, no, that's not a criticism of them, but they certainly came out of the civil rights movement, which is why some African Americans are a little nervous because they say, you know, they were always asking, where has he paid his dues? You know, how much is he, uh, you know, uh, advancing the civil rights agenda? He did not run on a civil rights or racial platform. He never did. He ran as a candidate and now a president for all the people. Uh, that was absolutely crucial to his success. And it was very welcoming and, and refreshing for Americans to vote for an African-American political figure who was not simply a racial figure, who was not a civil rights figure. Now, as president, I think he learned something from Bill Clinton's rather unfortunate experiences during his first year. Clinton really tackled some of these social issues head on. Not primarily race, but gays in the military, uh, gun control, um, abortion rights. We think we know what uh, Barack Obama believes. That he's liberal on most of those issues. He opposes same-sex marriage, but he hasn't really acted very much on that issue. He's, he has still not, well after 100 days, reversed the don't ask, don't tell policy about gays in the military. And he has said that he doesn't want to take up the issue of gun control, which Clinton believes cost the Democrats their majority in 1994. What he's doing is a conscious effort at avoiding those so social and cultural issues, including race, including race, because he, he does not want to divide the country the way Clinton did. Clinton, when he first became president, he took up a number of those issues, saw the country become bitterly divided. He was the first president ever to come out of the elite cultural values of the 60s. Um, and it created an instant division. You know, vast numbers of Americans always thought he was a draft dodger, a gun hater, abortion promoting, gay loving, womanizing, <laughs> all those things. And they hated him for his values. Well, Barack Obama, whatever, we, you know, his values are probably very similar to those of Bill Clinton, but he has, in my view, wisely been very, very cautious about pursuing those that agenda. Well, uh, the New York Times poll I was mentioning, they asked the question, do you think race relations in the United States are generally good or generally bad? In, what's the public from on five? In the, uh, the May of 1990, uh, white said 43% generally good, 50% generally bad, black said 33% generally good, 57% generally bad. In April of 2009, whites said 65% uh, generally good, 
an increase of 14% and only 21% generally bad, a decrease of 29%. Uh, blacks went from 33% generally good to 59% generally good, and went from 57 generally bad to 30 generally bad. So that's one. Um, you know, Bill and I both have done a lot of public opinion polling uh, in our day, and um, I think at a certain level these are good signs. And I don't think that we should denigrate the fact that the society has made progress. Um, I wonder if this election was as much about political change as it was about cultural change. That is, you know, um, a rejection of Bush era policies um, as much as an embrace of an African American candidate. Uh, B, I don't know that on the street, that is to say, uh, the likelihood of Barack Obama catching a taxi uh, in the nighttime in Manhattan has changed appreciably in the last 100 days. I don't know that interpersonal civility has changed much within the last 100 days, and I'm not sure public policy has changed much. So that's point two. Point three, I agree with you, Bill. In Basically, at the core of what you're saying, I might differ a bit on the intent. During the campaign, several of us were asked to write. There was a rump group for the administration to talk to them about race. And what we've been finding in our own research was that people would actually embrace, and that by people, primarily whites, would actually embrace progressive, race-specific policies if they were wrapped up in general American values that everybody agreed on. Opportunity was one. Um, getting people to see a shared fate, which by the way, you spent a lot of time trying to, to develop this value of interdependence, right? That we, we are connected in our fates, and if we're going to come out of this, we're going to have to do it collectively. And when you wrap up a sort of a racial ask, if you will, in those values, um, there is actually much more support than anybody has generally found. And I think, yeah, I, don't, I can't say that we would say that, you know, one of the times you give them the paper and you don't know where it goes, but um, we were arguing against a group that said, and the critique within part of the African American community and intellectual community was, if you don't get him to come out with a kind of identity politics agenda, there will never be policies, that, you will never find on his agenda policies that will get at uh, inequality in the society. Uh, I, I, and so some of us thought that's actually wrong. I think the proof will be in the pudding. We will see. To say it's a post-racial America is, I think, an absolute misnomer. And here's where I think the culture change will happen. I think it matters that you see this family in the White House. And we can talk about Obama's biraciality, but there's little doubt that the overall family in that White House is an African-American family, and whether it's the the mother-in-law, the brother-in-law, the <laughs> friends, the hairdresser, uh, the hairdresser pill going on. <laughs> this is different. This is, this is, and what it, the message it sends is that this is not atypical. Right? And I actually think the cultural change won't be seen for another generation or generation and a half. So many of you in the room with children who are under 10 or t under 12 or 13 or 14 years old, where they're seeing this every day as sort of a new normal part of life. Um, I think that's where the change at the cultural level start starts to happen and where the political change translates into the cultural change. Now, I think we should all be, I think every, and I'll think you all agree with me, everything we said, we will stand by our predictions, and of course, unless a few things happen, right? <laughs> One, if there's a, a bad scandal involving him personally, um, you know, so far no skeletons in the closet, no chattering on, um, in Washington as far as I know, but you, so no scandal involving him. You know. uh, two, you never know with a big uh, destructive event, and whether it's something like Katrina, by the way, which I think hurt Bush tremendously, or it's uh, uh, an international incident that it doesn't go well, 
I mean, then everything's sort of out the window. I don't know what other caveats you all would like to make. But I mean, I think that for those of us who follow politics, you know that when these things, these job data shocks in the system happen, sort of all bets are off. I mean, you just don't know what the response uh, uh, will be. Uh, but having said that, if those things sort of don't derail him, I think the change we will see maybe another generation or so from now. What's your tagline for this administration? What's your tagline for it right today? Uh, the president is more popular than his policies. I gave it you before. Okay. <laughs> Uh, not perfect, but very strong start. <clears throat> um, what's mine? <laughs> you were supposed to ask a question, you don't know the answer. I know the answer. I want to answer it and give it. Cream rises to the top. This is a guy that they said would not be ready on the, to lead on day one, that he would be too small on the world stage, that he couldn't be presidential, and we haven't heard a word about that. So whether he fails or succeeds, I, 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 I think that uh, talent and smarts is a good thing. And timing. His Ta sense of timing, timing is brilliant. Right. Said he was not supposed to run. It was Hillary's turn. Right. And he recognized what the country was looking for was someone who could bring it together. <clears throat> and the Clinton name is associated not with bringing the country together, but with dividing the country and with partisanship. He saw his opportunity and his sense of timing was brilliant. And if you ask Americans whether they think Barack Obama is tough and has been tested, they'll tell you yes. And the reason they give you is very simple. He beat the Clinton machine. <laughs> And then he beat the Republican machine. There's no more Soviet Union anymore, but those machines are pretty powerful. This was Obama captured the young vote, as you mentioned, it went Democratic. But two things. What about the young Republican vote? And what about the fact that the young don't stay young forever? <laughs> Uh, I didn't know there was a young Republican. <laughs> 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 uh, we like it. I mean, I, I, obviously, they're very well young people. Um, I think the question for them is as they get older, do they stay Democratic? And I think uh, there's not, nothing you can do other than try to, to start with them in your column, and they're definitely there now. So, I think, you know, again, something political scientists know young people become imprinted with the politics when they first entered the electorate. There was a depression generation. My mother, 96 years old, is a devoted Democrat, and she'll always tell stories about the depression. In fact, she shakes her finger at me and said, I've seen this before. <laughs> <laughs> they, uh, there, was a, there was a Ronald Reagan generation. You know, they, they, become, they tend to take the first impressions they get in politics, and they grow stronger over time, not weaker. They grow stronger over time. That's why. The, the White House and those of us in the media often talk about Generation O. It really is Generation O, which sees a new America. Those are his base. Uh, a politician once said, you have to have a base in politics. Your base are the people who are with you when you're wrong. Ronald Reagan had a base. His economic policies did not work for his first two years. The economy got worse. But when he said, stay the course, they stood with him. I think Barack Obama has that kind of base. People who believe in him, not in Reagan's case, it was an ideology. This isn't so much an ideology as a person. They believe in him, and I think if he has the Reagan experience and things don't get better even in two years, there are going to be people who stick with him. Next question, um, and I'll paraphrase it, Bill, and you mentioned that the uh, stimulus package is uh, $750 billion or something like that. So the question is, he appears to be making a serious attempt to address government spending, but what are your uh, thoughts on his likelihood of success? And in particular, uh, what does he say to fiscally conservative Democrats? There's a lot of money the government's spending. Uh, and this would be easy to characterize as a tax and spend liberal. 
Well, yeah, <laughs> they are characterizing well, as a tax and spend. Borrow and spend. Right. Borrow and spend. Spend and spend. Spend and spend. And that's the problem. You know, Republicans and critics of the administration, not all Republicans, you mentioned there are some fiscally conservative Democrats, huh? they will tell you that there's a hidden agenda here. Um, they will say that, you remember during the, when Reagan became president, he made a, had a big, temper off, radical tax cut. And that wasn't so hidden an agenda. The idea was called starve the beast. Cut off revenues from the federal government, and Congress will have to cut spending because the deficit will grow so big we can't stand it. It'll force Congress to cut spending. Wrong. Wrong. <laughs> um, but eventually we had a surplus about, 20, about uh, 10, 15 years later uh, because of economic growth. Republicans will say right now this administration has a hidden agenda. They're going to increase spending so massively, their hidden agenda is to force a tax increase. They can't talk about a tax increase, but if spending goes up so much, sooner or later, we're going to have to raise taxes. And after all, folks, that's what Democrats in their heart of hearts really want to do. <laughs> Obama's not talking about raising taxes. Congress never, never cut spending under Ronald Reagan, but somehow the system survived. And for a little bit of time, two, three or four years, there was no deficit. There was still debt, but there was no deficit. What's Obama's answer to that? The answer is simple. He uses it every day, growth. He says, we have to make these investments in order to build a foundation for economic growth. We are not going to raise taxes. We are not going to massively cut spending, maybe around the edges. And we'll raise some taxes, particularly on the wealthy, but nothing that would take care of the deficit and the, and the debt. What we are going to do is produce, we're going to invest in education and health care uh, and energy in such a way that the economy will zoom as it did in the 90s. And that cut the deficit, created a surplus for a little while. And we're going to have a surplus. And this investment will pay off. And the answer to the problem of all this spending is going to be, in one word, growth. That is why Obama always talks about building a sustainable foundation for growth. The only one I, I agree with all of that. Uh, I, I would just say, in fact, in your list of 10 uh, earlier, ago, I would say the one that is least plausible is that he will reduce the deficit. Uh, I mean, uh, whether that, if that growth comes, then that would be the way out of it. But there's nothing in his plan so far that foresees that, that justifies a prediction of the deficit. Um, two questions. Um, different, but I think both interesting, and I'm the same part. Uh, the first one is, what do the following is most likely to happen? Real health care reform, reform of entitlement programs, or meaningful action on climate change? Hmm. Uh, tough question. Yeah, I certainly don't know how to rank those. I mean, uh, I, I think, I guess I would put Healthcare reform as the one that is the highest on the administration's list now. Whether that is healthcare reform in a way that really addresses it in a, in a large systemic way, I don't know. Um, the the others uh, strike me as longer term or lower on their priority list. I don't know if that totally answers the question. So I think that's healthcare data. reform. I would think. Yeah. Well, was it, was it healthcare reform, reform of entitlement programs, or meaningful action on climate change. Healthcare. Okay. And the reason is that the coalitions have changed. Business, businesses are suffering right now. The health care costs are skyrocketing. Uh, and of course, the economy is in a mess. Uh, and they want, they want the government to take it over. I mean, they don't do anything. Single payer, you name it. I mean, single payer is Medicare folks. Um, and it worked pretty well. Uh, but you know, what, businesses have changed sides on this. And they are ready to work with the Obama administration to implement some kind of plan or policy to take the burden off businesses, which they've had since World War II, of paying for health care. Because it's a global economy, and if American businesses, unlike businesses in any other country in the world, are forced to pay for health care, they're going to be independent. The second question was kind of equally interesting one to me. And you mentioned it earlier, one of you did, I think Bill did, when you said Obama could speak to people of faith. And so this question is, um, Essentially asking the question, how is this faith issue going to play out? Clearly Bush mobilized a faith-based uh, constituency, but Obama has actually laid some claims 
on that constituency, which is really interesting given everything else about it. So you can see this as, as playing a role, or this being a kind of a, a as you suggested, I mean, one of your answers is that he's not going to fool around with cultural issues. But at some level, he's going to be asked to address this. So this become sort of a subtext. Uh, somewhere along the way? Is, the, is there a place to make inroads for him, for example? I think there's a part of the faith community that is completely available to him. That said, I don't think uh, Huckabee supporters are going to end mass. <laughs> <laughs> so I think part of it is available to him, and I think part is, is off limits uh, to him based on his policy. He wants to make it clear that Democrats and he himself are not enemies of people of faith. Uh, people of faith may, may become, have become more and more Republican over the years. Uh, but the Democrats have to make it clear that they are not against religion or against uh, exhibition of faith in this country, which is very important. We are the most religious industrial country in the world. Uh, it's part of our identity. It's the way America was founded. Uh, and you know, it's, it's very hard to stage any kind of political battle on, on that issue. I, I, I'll share with you, if you will indulge me, one simple story. I once taught at a distinguished Jesuit institution in Boston. There's only one, so it was Boston College. <laughs> <laughs> part of my, well, one of the privileges I had was to have a Friday afternoon audience with the Cardinal in Boston. This was many years ago. Uh, and that was quite a, it was the, I was invited for tea with the Cardinal. The first thing I discovered is that tea is a little stronger than tea. Um, <laughs> but when I was ushered into the Cardinal's presence, the Cardinal said to me, you are a professor of American politics, what should I know is happening in American politics? This was in 1991. And I said, well, Your, em Your Eminence, for the last 10 years or so since Reagan became president, the single biggest trend in American politics is Americans of faith, whether it's observant Catholics, or fundamentalist Protestants, or even Orthodox Jews, have become more and more Republican. And non-observant, or secular Americans, have become more and more democratic. And this is becoming the biggest divide in American politics. Today, it remains true. If you want to find out a person's politics, aside from asking are you a Democrat or Republican, the best question you can ask is, how often do you go to church? We've never seen this in American politics. And then I made a fateful mistake. I said to the Cardinal, you know, it rather bothers me that for the first time in this history, in our history, we have a party that claims to be a religious party in this country. And the Cardinal thought about it for a moment. He said, you know, it rather bothers me that we have a non-religious party. <laughs> and then I said, I think I'll have more tea. <laughs> well, on that note, I think that that concludes our program.